Welcome back to the 12 o'clock news. This week, as always, we have Harsha and Sideshow. Welcome back, guys. Yo. Yo. <laughs> That's a very gangster entrance into today's episode, isn't it? That's what happens when, you're, just... in, uh, when you're living in California, man. Mm. Yeah, so am I. I'm living in California, so yeah, you can tell there's no way to prove that. otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the first thing we want to talk about this week is the Rival Cage Rumble Returns, a nice $5,000 online tournament. Uh, what do you guys think about the teams involved in this one? It's pretty interesting. They got Selfless in. That kind of distinguishes it from the previous 5K tournament that was going on, the Cyberpower PC that happened, what was that, last week or something like that. Yeah. Uh, some of the similar teams as well, though. CLG looking to see if they can make the same kind of upsets, but... Evil Genius is also in there, and they've got uh, a qualifier as well for a couple more spots. So it should be a good tournament. So my eyes are actually on Cloud9. Uh, I think that they've been kind of... I mean, obviously, they're having a roster change with, uh, you know, Selly, which is going to be a later topic. But I think that um, they really need to solidify themselves as, like, a, a top NA team again because they've kind of been dawdling, I think. They lost to LG Evil at the last tournament, I believe. And, like, they just haven't really shown up. And now that Envious and Rogue are gone... This is kind of their chance to, uh, I think, re-enter the conversation as one of the best teams in North America. Yeah, there's also Renegades in the mix as well. They, I think that it's their first tournament in, what is it, since the Carbon Series or something crazy yeah. like that. It's been a long time since these guys have played. And now they've got two new players. They're two like, proper players as well because they were just playing with like a random six for the last six months. So it'll be interesting to see where those guys are. They kind of played before... LG Evil and Selfless got to the top and they were looking kind of competitive with kind of the beginning of Immortals before they really got going. I don't really expect them to break into like the current tier one of North America now that Envious and Rogue have left. They kind of took the tier one with them, I guess. But uh, yeah, that that should be an interesting one as well to see whether those guys, CLG, Rise, can put any dents in the, the people who should be able to get further through the bracket. All right, well, let's talk a little bit about that Cloud9. Selly was removed from Cloud9, and he's returning to Korea. He is, yeah. I mean, this is a bit of a weird one. It's um, We broke the story on Ovid.gg, and it's only been a month, actually, since they were officially announced onto the roster, but I think they were playing with them in North America for about a month before that as well. So yeah. they've, they've had time to kind of see if they were gelling. It was weird to watch Cloud9 as well because the... The thinking was, although I don't know whether they ever explicitly said this, was that they brought Zephyr into the team because he was really good on the off tanks. Like, he's a Zarya Diva player, and he can also flex onto other things. Fairly large hero pool, but specifically on the off tanks, which is really helpful in this meta. Um, and then they had brought Selly in to complement Shofar on the DPS. I think Bishop was kind of expecting him to be better on a wider range of DPS heroes, although he did actually play quite a number. He played, like, the... Um, the Soldier 76 most of the time, and then played the Roadhog and Genji occasionally as well. The tracer towards the end. Yeah, but they were all rotating between basically all of them. They all picked up Genji at some point, so it certainly seemed like there was... And Shofar went off the Diva sometimes as well, so it wasn't even like they were playing around Selly. They were kind of playing... I, I, I actually don't know what they were doing in terms of the hero picks. Like it, it, it doesn't seem to be any kind of a system, so there's something weird going on there anyway. I felt like it was almost almost too much flexibility for their own good because yeah you're definitely right like they were they were all over the place nobody was uh, on a consistent like hero at, at any point in time and I don't know like at some point I don't know why they put uh, Sherfer onto the diva like I I thought that Zephyr was supposed to be kind of taking that role up and like uh, they they would have allowed Sherfer to focus more on the projectiles and and Selle more on the hit scan because like that's kind of what they're I guess known for best. I mean, obviously, Surefor is a very versatile player and can play anything. But um, I mean, I guess I guess when you look at how they how the team kind of performed at the last few tournaments, they didn't perform up to expectations. I, I guess with two months of prep, that's kind of when you know uh, whether a roster should be working or not. Yeah. And I guess Bishop was saying that he didn't think that Selly is like a really aggressive style meshed well with Cloud Nines. Uh, I guess more laid back, maybe a bit more passive style. I don't know. It's 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 kind of a weird explanation because it's not really the characterization you'd give players like gods or like sure for, in my opinion. So I think that what really was the problem was that like Sally was just kind of uh, I think the communication was was off somewhere because Sally was using a lot of ultimates at, at like poor times and stuff like that. So 
I, definitely a very talented player, but I don't know what's really going to happen with him. Um, obviously, there are rumors now that uh, Kaiser will be joining the team and that Gods will be moving from his role as main tank to back to like the flex slash DPS role. I actually yeah. don't know what I think of this. Um, I don't... Because when you think of Gods, you think of like the, the hit scan DPS that he used to be, the uh, McCree and Soldier 76 main. But like... His Genji didn't really scream like amazing to me when when he played in Apex, and I think that's what they really want him to do. I always find it weird as well that they don't want to put Shofar on the Genji because yeah. although he's not like he used to play Genji a lot back in like kind of beta and when they the team was first formed and stuff and was always like one of the best Genjis, but he never played it too much in the interim, and I think. From just kind of snippets when he was talking on like around the watch and stuff like that, he was saying that he didn't, um, he never really grinded the mechanical side of Genji. I think is like a fair representation of what he was saying. Like he he never felt like he was perfectly on top of it and making sure that he did all of the like little tricks to maximize his damage and stuff like that. But actually, whenever you see him play Genji, that can be some of the best fights that Cloud Nine take. Yeah, absolutely. So, so I feel like maybe putting him. Like, the thing with Shofar is perhaps you need to nail him down in a specific role. The guy's got so much talent, um, but kind of seems to go where, either wherever the team needs him or wherever he feels comfortable in the moment. You know, you can't really tell whether it's him or the team making the decisions at that time. But perhaps what you really need to unlock him as a proper star in terms of like a carry potential and that somebody that's going to launch his team into being a, a proper world-class roster is if you actually just nail him down and say, right, dude, you just have to focus on this, this, and this. And this is your role within the team. You need to smash this out of the park and not just try and cover everybody else's weaknesses. Like, just really nail down your specific aspect and the rest of the team will do the rest. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. I think that um, that could be, like, the key to unlocking his, like, full carry performance, you know, because he's definitely, like, very famous for being a top-level player. But I guess when the team is not winning, it how much does that matter, right? You want you want to give your team the best chance of, that they have at winning. I, I do think that... Um, putting sure for it in like the best position that he can be in to carry the team is at the end of the day like the right choice to make putting gods on the genji though i'm not sure i can remember a performance from gods on genji like i, so he, I remember yeah go he on. played it he played it i think on route 66 once in it might have been a, against africa or something like that it was uh during season two of apex it looks it looked very average. I remember uh, Mendo and Sherfor being the standouts during that game, whereas Genji, like, it didn't die that much, but it didn't do anything else. And you, that's not really what you what you're looking for in a Genji, right? You want somebody that's going to be kind of not flashy in a sense, but somebody that will be doing a lot of a lot of uh, damage with that hero, getting the resets and stuff like that. I think yeah. he looked. He actually looked pretty good on the on the Winston. So it's kind of it is kind of a weird switch uh, that we're seeing. Maybe there's something wrong with the Reinhardt. Uh, we don't really yeah. know that right now. But um, well, even if he's even if he's got like a good Winston and uh, average to below average Reinhardt, which I think would be a fair assessment of what we've seen so far from Gods, is that Kaiser is one of the best Reinhards in the game, or, or has shown that that he was on that level within Runaway last season at the very least, and his Winston's pretty good as well. So adding him into the team is, if he can fit with the system that they've got, is surely going to be like an upgrade in that sense. The guy's a god tier on tank. But does that mean that the whole team is going to get better? See, and I think it's strictly an upgrade on, on the tank, whereas I don't know if it'll be an upgrade in terms of DPS or flexing role. I imagine because they, they kind of called God's the flex DPS that um, he and Zephyr will split time on like playing the second DPS where Surefor is going to get the, the full time playing DPS, and we always uh, kind of draw conclusions about Cloud9's roster before they happen, and then they kind of throw things out the window by putting sure <laughs> for on D.Va. So, like, I don't know. I would I would hope that uh, what they're going to do is, is uh, I think what, what's going to happen is Zephyr will play, like, the Zarya and D.Va if need be, and then uh, Gods will likely be on the Roadhog. And he has actually uh, shown, like, a pretty solid Roadhog. But I do worry if they're going to put him on the projectile DPS because I don't think that's his strength. As well, it hasn't been reported or confirmed or anything that uh, Kaiser is actually moving to Cloud9. It just seems right. to make sense from the speculation point of view of he has definitely left Runaway. He tweeted about it and Runaway was talking about it on stream and stuff. Um, he decided to be picked up by a Western team and Cloud9 seems to be... I mean, they've got like the Korean guys and, and, uh, and looking for say, a tank. 
he did say a team with capital, like because like I mean, obviously the reason he's leaving Runaway is because he needs to pay his family's medical bills or something like that. So something kind of crazy out there. But um, I mean, Cloud Nine does seem like the best fit, especially when they're moving gods. This is definitely confirmed, by the way, that they're moving gods to the the flex slash uh, other DPS role. Yeah, that was by Bishop was leaked from the Cloud9 Discord or something like that and posted all over Reddit that they were going to <laughs> uh, try and move gods over. Well, that'll be interesting to see how that works. I mean, Cloud9 have shuffled a lot of their roster around. The only two players they've ever kept is Shofar and Adam. And definitely people were pointing fingers when uh, the most recent change happened, when Sully was removed. People were like, well, what's the what's the saying about, like, if everybody you meet's an asshole, maybe you're the asshole maybe or something? Yeah, yeah but... If everyone... uh, oh, yeah. So, I don't know whether... I mean, Adam and Shofar are the only guys to stay on the team the whole time. I don't know whether, really, you can point the finger over there, though, because it doesn't seem to be, like, a problem with them. Maybe there's something internal where it's, like... The only thing that I could possibly think is, like, Shofar wants to call the shots and, like, build the team around himself. But at the same time, he doesn't really seem to do that too much. Otherwise, why wouldn't he just put himself in, like, the star position? Why would he, why would he go to Diva if he was doing that kind of stuff? So, I don't think you can really point the finger there. Okay, so um, also on the topic of team rosters, three more bite the dust. We have Fnatic, Dignitas, and LG Loyal all dropping their players' rosters. Um, you said this is seven now, seven teams? Seven total, I believe. The Survivor Overwatch Twitter is just going crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I actually had this theory that because originally Blizzard had said, you know, not to pick up teams, my theory was that kind of by letting the scene die and allowing these orgs to like drop their rosters and continuing to not allow you know any kind of third-party tournaments that this was kind of designed that way because obviously those players need to have contracts with blizzard when when eventually the, the overwatch league comes around and so theoretically if you have a contract with an org then you would have to have that contract bought out in order to be a free agent to be able to be picked up so that was always my theory it was that just wait there sammy wait there i'm just putting my tinfoil hat on <laughs> He had one. Got just, it on. Had one just I like that you had one available yeah. for when this occurred. No, it's just a, it's just a tinfoil wrapper from some chocolates or something. I probably dumped a load of shit all over my head, but <laughs> no one uh, noticed. I definitely heard other people saying the same thing. Like, uh, there's been a, a number of people behind the scenes who've got the same kind of like train of thought of you as like, isn't this lovely that all of the teams are dropping and there's this massive pool of free agents just as supposedly a combine and the preseason for Al supposed to come around? But to me, I don't quite buy it. Like, I, I see it. But that would be, like, they'd have had to think in advance and go, like, oh, shit, a lot of these players have been, uh, like, uh, drafted into organizations. Maybe we should hint to organizations that they should drop their teeth. I don't know. It's so far out. I, I just like can't see it. starving the scene does that pretty clearly, like, by not having But any it just, it's like shooting yourself in the foot. It's like Blizzard are like, oh, I, I, I'm going to literally cut my own foot off here. Wouldn't it be more just comfortable so that... thinking they did it on purpose than that they just, like, it just died and they were just like, oh, whoops, didn't see that one coming. Like, <laughs> I feel oh, more man. comforted by the idea that it was done on purpose, personally. Well, but here's the thing. Richard if we Lewis look back in a year... This, and in November yeah. of last year when they announced this, Richard Lewis just talked about this because he was talking about CGS and how this had happened before and that all of those teams, those players, had to have their contracts bought out and how much money was spent buying out all those contracts. And wouldn't it be funny if Blizzard had to do that for their league? Because if you've already got a contract, there's no way, like, it has to get bought out by somebody. It's a legally binding I contract. Don't... But it doesn't. You could just leave those players. Like, who who gives a shit about these players who are just stuck in contracts? Like, if they want to play an owl, their organizations are going to buy in. Otherwise, you could just leave them. Like, there there are. You're there never going to have. But the, there doesn't have to be a draft as well. You could just have literally the free agents. Like, you can have whatever free agents happen to be in the pool, plus all your like seventy five thousand pros, which is like the the people in the ladder, right? We assume that's what the, the number was meant to be. So you just. Those are your players in the draft for the combine or whatever. You don't need some kind of conspiracy theory to get them all out of the contracts, I don't think. My big issue with this is that this is the first time we've actually seen, a, I, I would say, a top-tier team actually be like get dropped. Because before we saw, like, what, TSM, Denial. Denial doesn't really count, I don't think, because they that was more no. of, like, a payment issue. Um, we saw Complexity. We saw Splice. Um, and so Red now Reserve. LG Loyal, Red, Red Reserve, and... Uh, What's the last one? I'm fanatic. Not, fanatic. Okay, so those are those all teams. Like, all of them had been underperforming for quite some time. I don't. Well, I, I can't really say that about Red Reserve. They just haven't really. 
they don't really have a scene to perform in in the first place. But um, with all these other teams, they, they do have some talent on their rosters, but all of these rosters have not really done anything in terms of placement in a long time. And actually, this this Dignitas getting like getting dropped is the first time I think we've seen like a full top tier team actually get dropped, which I think was. Uh, I mean, that's what makes it really strange to me, right? Especially when they have, like, the 76ers backing them. They do have, like, a, you know, like a, a historic brand in esports and, and everything like that. And this team just got third at Overwatch Pit, um, beat Misfits, beat NIP, like, very clearly a very solid team in EU and got dropped. So I wasn't really worried when I heard about all these other rosters, like LG Loyal in particular. They had a bunch of top-tier players, I, I would say, but they haven't accomplished anything in, in Perhaps their whole existence, honestly. If we're if we're like, being, <laughs> I mean, if we're, yeah. if we're being serious about this, like, I don't, I can't remember a time where they've no, actually, they haven't. yeah. So, complexity hasn't done anything in a long time. You know, even since uh, I would say, I mean, they got I think top four at the NGE land, but that was a very like not stacked tournament. Um, TSM didn't even have their full roster, honestly. Uh, like, okay, like all of these teams just hadn't performed. Dignitas is a first like i would say the first reason anybody has to worry and even then they did say they want to re-enter overwatch so like Everybody i do think that, that yeah i do think that these organizations all do actually want to be involved with the scene but no stuff that we don't really know at this point in time i think i think if there's just not going to be a third party scene for overwatch then there's not going to be the same kind of community that you normally get with esports where there's a middle ground for people to actually build up through in order to get to that pro level or even having like these minor teams that can play in lower leagues because if everything is being run by blizzard then there's no room for anybody to get in it's like locked down and i, I that just doesn't seem healthy to me i feel like you're building a spectator sport where no one feels like they can participate and I think part of the fun of esports for a lot of people is playing on those low-level ESEA teams to feel like they're a part of it. So I'm the sure... Game, oh yeah, go the ahead. game would be dead. Like, if they actually did that, the game would just, like, die. Because if they if they only run with the Owl and don't have any way for, like, developing players to get in, if you have players that underperform, you've got no one to replace them with. If you have teams that die or disband, you've got nobody, like, coming up through the ranks or whatever. So there has to be some structure, and there will be a structure. Like, they announced that there's going to be an off-season. But there's also got to be other things running at the same time as Owl. Like, the, there's certainly going to be things running at the same time as Owl in other regions. Mm -hmm. It's unclear as yet whether there'll be th other things running at the same time as Owl within th that particular region. But in my view, like, I can't see a world in which there isn't, because what the hell do the rest of the teams do? Like, Blizzard aren't aren't like looking at this like we're gonna create 16 teams and they're gonna be the only 16 that are allowed to survive <laughs> that they've, they've got to be a, there has to be a system for other teams to play in i think there's absolutely going to be some sort of like d2 system or like uh minor leagues or something like that there's no way blizzard is going to make it so that there's like what um 16 times 6 so like i'm not going to do the math is that 96 players it's 96 yeah. players so well it, there's done. no way to you just... did the math <laughs> there, ready to come slash we did the math there's there's definitely no way that they're only going to have that many like less than 100 players uh relevant in the scene there has to be some sort of scene like holding up these pros like uh keeping it like in place and, and historically that comes from the community like a, like a yeah sure sure league, sure but like if it's if it's not then then what it's, well, then we, it's just league of so legends we we do yeah. yeah i mean true but that but, would um, also be fine everybody like, having loves some kind of Having some kind of like challenger system underneath, uh, underneath it, like the way that Apex has like its challenges series underneath that the aspiring teams well, can get into, and they have like offline qualifiers like and stuff like that. It can't work like that because there's going to be franchising, right? Mm. So I think yeah, yeah. I think they're going to have to draw from a these system that they can. Yeah, yeah. You just it's the same way as like franchising would happen in the LCS if that comes to be the case. Like you have a lower level. That's completely separate. There's no promotion or relegation, but you can certainly see if there's a really sick team that deserves to be in there. And then the bottom level team in Owl or whatever just goes, "Well, what the fuck am I keeping hold of my six players for? They've yeah, just exactly. been losing all of their games." Out you get, and in in with the new. Uh, there's just because it's franchising it doesn't mean the actual players are going to stick around any longer than they would in the normal league. Because if you've got a losing team, what incentive is there to keep hold of them? You might as well chuck them if you if you know that you're going to lose the next season. What like why on earth would you keep hold of? Uh, of those players. I think it's more challenging in this game as well because it depends so much more on teamwork. You can't really carry as much and so that means that team chemistry is a lot more important 
than in pretty much any other FPS game where you could be a god and a jerk at the same time and it wouldn't matter. <laughs> I mean, TF2 is a pretty shiny example yeah. of that. <laughs> uh, but I mean, like teamwork just doesn't matter as much in other games. That that's not even who I was thinking of. <laughs> oh, <laughs> but people, I mean, you can get away with people it always in games that are DM heavy. But in Overwatch, where there's like no real like focus on DM and no real carry potential. I mean, you can if you're an absolute god. But how many people do you think can really carry an Overwatch? Carry an entire team of potatoes that don't work well together? It's not going to happen. So team building is going to be incredibly difficult for new team owners who come from sports ball and yeah. don't really know anything about video games and think like i could just pick up six of the best players and they're gonna get along great it's like you were talking about last week like you can't just pick yeah. up any six players and expect them to perform well together and i think the the constant roster changes are indicative indicative of that because we have roster changes when when the scene was still like somewhat thriving or starting off there were roster changes like every fucking three seconds right because you have to get six people that actually don't want to kill each other and also play well together. And that's really difficult to do in a game that's so frustrating to play. Just to play devil's advocate, we don't actually know what the game will look like going into Overwatch League. I really do hope that they that they throw in, I guess, more ability to carry the game as like a solo player. I don't, I don't know how you would implement this, by the way. Like, I don't really know how you'd make this game more DM heavy, especially when it, there it's like class based, like a. Uh, it does depend on like strategy, moving in together, stuff like that. But I don't think that Overwatch is going to look like what it does right now. And I, I do hope. Like I know Monty has been very uh, vocal about wanting like carry potential within these games, and he's obviously advising Blizzard right now. I do hope that people bring this concern up. Like we do get like superstars within Overwatch League. It's not just going to be like a team game. But. I mean, is that a concern for you at the moment? Do you feel like there's no superstars in Overwatch at the moment? No, but I do think that, um, to put it this way, there's, there, are, there are definitely superstars. You see people like Taimu able to pop off in solo carry. But I do think that, in general, the game is incredibly team-based. And I, I do think that, uh, not, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but I do think that I, I, I wish there was more ability to carry a game as a solo player, just from... Just from like experiences on the ladder, stuff like that. Like, obviously, the game is very different at, at different levels, but I do think that um, you just hate getting dragged down by five pleb anchors like yeah. attached to your legs. That is what it is. It, it's uh, it's never me. In terms of the actual like pro scene, though, I think I I do agree with you. Almost every game that has this blend of like uh, basically every team FPS, you always get people saying like, "Are you you know the teamwork is so important in this game, etc." Uh, but I think more than, like, it's weird. It's a completely different type of teamwork to a lot of other games, but certainly there there is less, like, individual carry potential than almost any other game that I can think of that is a team-based anything. Like, even including the MOBAs, you can have more star carry players, or, or you put more resources, like, direct resources into those carry players. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like, because obviously you guys come from TF2, and that's a 6v6 game, but I feel like having more players within the game kind of dilutes the effect that one person can have. I don't know if that's true about TF2. No. Well, it wasn't yeah, true in yeah, TF2, but I can scout. see what... Well, I mean, if you if you compare that to something like... Um, like, there was a 9v9 mode in TF2 as well that was just, like, just a car crash. Like, if anyone ever complains about spectatability in Overwatch, send them over to Highlander, which was what they called this 9v9 TF2 it was thing. An organized I mean... Yeah, but certainly there, I mean, I can see your argument that increasing the player the player size diminishes, like, one person. At the same time, you did actually have, like, individual things like, I mean, the sniper in that game was super overpowered. You just hit, like, 150 damage from anywhere, which is the same size. I mean, it's like a like a really buffed Widowmaker or whatever. But even when you got it up to nine, like, the difference between five and six, I don't think, makes that much difference. I think it's just the, the fact that in Overwatch there's so many... Uh, abilities that require the rest of your team to be participating on the yeah. same wavelength as you like it's not even like something like league or dota where you can outplay individually with your abilities as much they're so synergistic you do have to combine ultimates and stuff like that it's not it's not just like a, a single player like I, I press this button and i can carry the fight well here's yeah. the thing though like t2 had scouts which had insane movement capabilities and they could flank like a genji or a tracer and just drop the medic and you know, the whole game then turns in your favor. Whereas, like, that doesn't really happen in Overwatch. If you kill an Ana, there's another healer that's going to pop up and take over. So it doesn't really or one that have big of an impact. Or the, or one that reses her. So, so you do all this work to flank, you do all this work to get the important pick, and it turns out you don't have an advantage. And so it's... I mean, 
that just that just makes the importance in a different sense though doesn't it It doesn't actually like lessen the import it just means that you can't go for the solo plates like your dps plates actually do have to carry right. and in that's the fights, yeah they have to carry but they have to carry like in full 6v6 fights which is a lot more challenging than in yeah. like a, a combo scenario um, but know. to bring it back to like the original point, I don't think there is actually a problem at the moment with lack of superstars. Certainly if they were building up like the content, you know, like the CS does for the Valve Majors and stuff like that, where they're rotating it around like one star player for this team, you could certainly still do that in Overwatch. Like maybe you could argue that the bias within the spectating and stuff makes us think about the DPS players as more of the carries, but there are certainly carries outside of that as well. Players like uh, Jehong or Unko. Okay. Um, I mean, I can't really think of that many people you would really put on that level as Lucio. Even the people that who you think of as like the top tier Lucio is like I don't know yeah, Toby or Chris not. or people like that. I mean, they're not even the they're not the superstars. What do you, what do you have there? You have Boops and uh, Wall Rides. You don't really have yeah. a lot of room to do anything. Cool. I mean, yeah, you got you got can like apply a lot of pressure and have clutch sound barriers, but yeah, it's yeah. all just very it's all just very supportive and kind of in the in the background more than flashy real direct plays. But yeah, I don't think there's a particular issue there. I, don't know. I can't even remember I, I how we got into so, talking about Well, we were talking about team building and, and when these teams are getting purchased oh, right, and building yeah, the yeah. league out, point it's is... just going to be more challenging for people to actually make like co cohesive teams. And I think we're going to end up with a lot of like really bad teams when Overwatch League starts just because people think they can throw six people together and they're going to play well. I think I got off off topic here. I think I'm the reason this derailed. But uh, my, my whole point here was that I do want to find a way where... Uh, superstars can be emphasized more within the game i think makes it more fun mm. to watch too like you have like that one player that you follow and you think it's awesome at the game you don't want to watch them get shut down all the time by winston because that makes it really sad because yeah. then you don't then you don't have that same excitement you know you don't you don't trust them to get out of that in a clutch because i don't know um but the yeah the point about teams potentially being bad when they launch owl i think is a very valid one like the idea of franchising and having the best teams in the world playing in Overwatch League doesn't really work unless you're constantly refreshing your rosters to bring in like the better and better rosters. And the, the game the hasn't is... been around long enough yet. It's not a real eSport yet. Like there, there just haven't been, there's been no lands. There's like one or two lands and it's just like there, there hasn't been enough to base skill off of to be able to figure out who's good. It's I think the all problem been online. That people, people like talk about how franchising is bad and everything, but I feel like, um, well, not bad, but in the sense that you won't get the, the top competition from franchising. I think that, um, I mean, you still have to think about how the losing teams will never be known in the same way as the top level teams. Like they won't have the brand recognition. They won't have the sponsorships. They won't have like, they, there, there's still a lot of stuff at risk for being a, a lower level team. And so I, I do think that it gives you um, kind of a safety net, but you, you, you're not like, out of the woods, so to speak, even if you're still locked into the league. But you could, I could definitely see a situation where somebody isn't having success with their roster. Like, for example, let's use NRG, mostly because they're an easy punching bag, but also fit into this idea, is that if, if you had a roster like NRG, buys into Overwatch League, even not just the first season where, you know, people don't really know where the competition's at and there's some new rosters in there, let's say, but even a couple of years down the road, like you could still stick with that roster. They would be insanely popular. They would be bringing in a lot of money, etc. Even if they were coming last place, like there are there are surely American teams uh, in proper sports leagues that end up coming bottom all the time, but have just a really strong fan base anyway, right? It's not like necessity that. In fact, there has to be teams. Like there always have to be teams that lose. Uh, That's low bills. Consistent. That's the thing, though. They don't. It's generally uh, the teams with like either legacies or the teams that are in very populated areas that have the big fan bases. So, like, yes, while I can see your complaint, it's, like, the Lakers, terrible team this year, but they have a ton of fans. Like, they sell out every game. But that's because they have, like, this this history of success, right? So I think it is a bit different in sports, and you do have to consider that we – because we had a, an esports scene before, like, before Overwatch League existed, that's kind of why these people have their popularities, especially with, their, their like, the stream numbers and everything. But I do yeah. think that – once you open Overwatch to like a bigger um, an audience, I guess, uh, I do think it, it could change. I don't think you'd have a situation like NRG where they're just sticking around with these players for for years and years on end. Especially because you don't want your you don't want your brand rec uh, brand um, associated with losers, so to speak. Yeah, and just... not not to not to like bash on NRG. I'm just saying that like if if you're a company that wants to sponsor a team you want to sponsor the team like hoisting the trophy you don't want to sponsor the team that's always consistently like the butt of every joke right 
Very possibly. Yeah. I mean, you still how... sell a lot of merchandise though, so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not completely swayed. Like, I think definitely like adding really popular players in, but at the same time, other players are going to get more popular as time exactly. goes on. Right? That's, that's, these yeah. these players are not going to be the most popular forever. Uh, unless they start unless winning they again, are. or, or yeah. <laughs> yeah, unless they are. Unless Siegel is just the most popular player forever on out. I mean, he could be. He's got a bit of a lead by now, hasn't he? How how much do you think uh, we should be concerned about organizations dropping their rosters uh, at this stage? Like people are kind of having a little bit of a shit fit about it on Reddit. But do you think that's reasonable? I don't think it's not. I'm so on. Oh, go, oh, go ahead. You both so polite. We're so yeah. British in here today. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, I don't. I'm not very concerned at all, honestly. Like, I, I think that we're still going to have um, a very solid, like, ten to sixteen teams, whatever, whatever the number is. I think we're going to have a like a fine Overwatch League. I don't know if, how successful it will be in terms of viewership, but I think it, at the end of the day, it won't look, it won't, it won't be a disaster or anything. And I don't think that, um, like, the only team here that I was w kind of like put off to see uh letting their team go was dignitas and i have heard that, that there have been like internal troubles like i know bromus was saying um he wants to try a new challenge he's been stuck on a team with linkser and uh toxican for like a really long time now stuck. so like i, I mean <laughs> <laughs> but um i think that uh i think that at the end of the day and this is this is definitely not the end of the, the roster droppings that we're going to see right but i think at the end of the day we'll still have a a solid 10 to 16 teams like whatever the number is in overwatch league i think that all the players that are that are top tier will find a, a spot somewhere i just know that it, it just sucks right now for the players uh, especially like i don't i don't think it matters for anybody else but for the players who have given up uh kind of their whole life just to play this game uh and they don't really know of their future that's that's the only real complaint i can see uh yeah i i don't think it's a problem at all in fact like i said i, I think it was designed on purpose like I, I think that this is <laughs> this is the ideal scenario i think putting that, on your hat. yeah i'm putting on my hat i've got it i've I got my tinfoil hat right the first season of the league my theory again the first season of the league will be 2018 that's my theory it'll be 2018 and i think we're gonna see a lot of people that we've never effing heard of before that's what i think is gonna happen we're gonna see a lot of familiar faces and stuff like that but i think because the scene is so small right now and the name recognition is already quite low I think we're going to end up with teams picking up players that no one's ever heard of or that just came from other games. And it's going to turn out that a lot of the people who have made these sacrifices get totally hosed. That's what I think is going to happen. And it's really unfortunate, but I think as long as there aren't resources for them to be able to play the game and to be able to prove themselves independently, it's going to make it really difficult. Because if all of that is locked down by Blizzard, there's not going to be a lot of open tournaments that you can just jump in and play, right? You're going to have to qualify in some way. They're going to be honing it down. The, the, the one thing that Blizzard has always been very, very strong about is exclusivity. They love excluding people. It's been a pattern throughout Overwatch since day one, since before the game came out. You remember Only Watch. Do you, do you hear about how the World <laughs> Cup was when they did the World Cup for Overwatch, the first one? They have this uh, no. tiny little space, right? And if you think about it, this is their first like major event for Overwatch that they've done, right? And it's in this small room, maybe 200 chairs. They've got it completely walled off, sectioned off, no TVs, nothing. You don't even get to see the side of someone's face from inside the stadium. You have to wait in a line to get in, and they only let in like 50 people at a time or whatever as people get up and leave to fill seats. So it's completely sectioned off from the rest of the event. Meanwhile, StarCraft's got this huge space that can fit five times as many people, and they're not using that for Overwatch. Overwatch was tiny. It was very, very small. There were no TVs showing any of it. There was one TV in the entire, the entire event that had a rebroadcast of it going on, and there were thousands of us crowded underneath this one TV to watch what was happening. This is a pattern that they have of keeping things exclusive. This is how they work. And I feel like it builds that, it, it does build a bit of excitement for people that they don't always know what's going on. It's not completely transparent. It makes it a little mysterious. It makes it a little more interesting. And I think there's a lot of marketing that goes into that. But I think that that's how the league is gonna be. I think they're gonna want it to feel exclusive. They're gonna want it to feel like you have to jump through all these hoops to get there. So I think I just I just one comment on that. I think that um, they purposefully kept like the World Cup looking the way it was was be because it was more of a show for investors rather than like. Oh, definitely. I mean, I, this is kind of tinfoily as well, but like I think that they were just <laughs> they were just more trying to show off like what Overwatch could look like to to those investors and they didn't really care about the uh, 
Well, not not that they didn't care, but they they weren't as focused on the. Uh, it's like a like second the, priority. Yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly. I think it was built very clearly to to make it feel exclusive. Like that. Sure. That, definitely, that feel was throughout um, throughout that event specifically, and that's the only official Overwatch event that's existed from Blizzard. So that's all we have to look at, right? That's all they've ever done, and it was built that way on purpose. So that just kind of I I don't know the the way that things have happened and the way that like you know stuff has been hidden from the community for the most part no one really i mean even when we find stuff out it's very quiet and it's very little like tidbits of it's information leaked by, and it's, it's leaked. leaked by sideshow yeah bloody it's, leakers it's who never, are these leakers where are they coming from <laughs> it's never you know and like you said blizzard does tend to keep very tight-lipped and then they come out with this big bomb to drop on everybody and that that, that is their style but i think at the same time they they do build a sense of exclusivity and i think that that's going to continue in the overwatch league and i think that's going to make it very difficult for people to uh, you have that like little kid that plays football in a peewee football league and buys the jerseys for his favorite player and stuff like that and i think that's something that esports has always had is that feeling of i could download this game and if i get really good at it i can be that guy buying a fucking you could be you could be crusher 99 car yeah, I could be Crusher 99. That that's the a main theme in esports is that everybody wants to feel that way. Everybody wants that feeling that if I try really hard and I get really good at this game, I could be a pro too. And I think that the 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 things that have happened so far with Overwatch are leading in the opposite direction. Because the number one feedback that you always hear from people is that playing scrims is fun. Playing Overwatch competitively is fun. Playing anything but that is a nightmare. And that's what you hear from basically every pro. I haven't heard anyone say, I love playing quick play. I love playing ranked. SR is the best. I love <laughs> playing ranked with Sideshow. <laughs> does you know I mean? does like any that... pro in any game play it, like say that though? Are, are we just- That's true, have that's you true. Got, just got like a, like, um, what's but it even called? Imagine, that be like selection bias? Imagine a Because you're only listening to the pros, the you only know? way, like there were no, e there were no ESEA pugs, there's no face it, there's nothing like that, right, where you can play competitive. There's no TF2 center. The only way that you can play competitively is through the in-game SR system. That's it. That's Not all you get. So imagine yeah, that, I'm... and that's how you become a pro. You have no other way to get there. I mean, you, they, they could make KD another system, pro? though. They have, like, uh, the OW runs in-house pugs whenever they have, uh, whenever there's no... Whenever, like, the, the ranked is down, right? Right. So, which which they are while, reducing, though. by the way. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, mean they... I do believe that third parties will come in and run stuff like that. I'm just saying, like, imagine where, like, you, the only way that you can get into the league is by having good SR. That puts a lot more pressure I mean, that was a on playing a, a format that you don't enjoy. That was a component of it as well, though. But they did also say made their name in third party tournaments and yeah, yeah, something yeah. else as well. So it's not, I thought it's not purely going to be based on SR as well. Uh, so. Here's, if we can. Uh, like subject ourselves to another tension I have my own tinfoil hat theory but this one goes the opposite way we're going on another tangent right get your tinfoil hats out boys or your rappers or whatever you've got that, that, <laughs> goodbye go. uh, but this one's the other way around right so I want to attempt to give like a tinfoil hat from Blizzard's perspective so you apologist I know I know I'm such a shill someone's <laughs> gonna get hired <laughs> I don't want to work for Blizzard but uh, say that now. if <laughs> if um, you've knocked me off my off off kilter here immediately, okay, I've got it, I've got it, I'm back with it. Yeah, it was the hat. I've lost the hat, man. Okay, so Blizzard are the whenever there's like two things, two entities that are either negotiating with each other or battling each other in like terms of he said she said or rumors and stuff like that the guy who's got like the ndas and can't talk and the big corporation is always going to be the one that's giving out less information right so the the thing's always going to be slanted like against them because the, the other people can talk freely they can like spread rumors etc yes. so so with the with the recent post you know you saw that yahoo thing that uh, was like the blizzard respond to um they, they, they sent that i think they sent that to a bunch of outlets because i know the, the score said they got that email to uh, uh, a right, bunch okay. of different all but right yeah. but they they sent out like an official response to the richard lewis report and also the espn report from jacob wolf and they warned in general terms the most interesting part of that uh, uh, along with all the pr fluff to me was this like warning against uh Unnamed sources, like, 
and the thing. Now, some people interpreted that as like just an attack on the the journalists using unknown sourcing, which is just like a, a clear and well documented thing in journalism. This is how you do it because certain sources don't want to put their name to things, and they still have reliable information to give you. But if you think of it another way, and you think about it like almost definitely the sources in the in those reports are going to be from the organizations themselves. Yeah. Like, nobody else knows this. They're giving their uh, why would anybody from Blizzard come across and give that kind of information? They're the other party in the negotiation. So if they then have the ability to kind of leak information that is that makes it seem like a bad deal for them, etc., yeah. and force public pressure like onto Blizzard as a company, like what the fuck are you doing? Ruining the scene, what's happening? Orgs can then also like drop their teams. There's no reason for them to keep their team. You don't need the team to get into the Overwatch League, as far as I know. There's no reason why that should be the case. You don't want to keep a bad team to get into Owl anyway, so why the fuck would you? And you have to pay to keep them, and there's no third party tournament. So it's just a bad deal all round at the moment in Overwatch to keep teams. Teams, organizations were keeping teams because it gives them like some initial foothold in the Overwatch scene. They can establish their name. They have like a little bit of a legacy, like a team like Fnatic or Dignitas. People will remember them if they come back into the Overwatch scene later on down the road. They'll know that they're like a, a well-respected organization as well, and they have like some history as well. But at the moment, it doesn't make sense to keep hold of them. So my tinfoil hat theory is this: the, the current understanding that we have from the outside from the public perspective of the overwatch league and the negotiations that are happening could be pretty harshly slanted not by giving false information but just not by giving the full picture for example with the 2021 revenue split that seems like madness from the snippet of information that was given now yeah. maybe that is madness it absolutely could be but it could also be they specifically said that it was once certain uh points were hit for the league or something and they didn't go into further information about that now maybe they didn't go into further information out of respect for blizzard and respect for the negotiation or whatever but it could also be because those points are very easily hittable and are just about having like i don't know some overarching infrastructure and it all looks stable and etc and then the actual revenue sharing is really quite large but they didn't want to divulge that kind of information i my point is it's perfectly possible that our current take on the overwatch league has been fairly pessimistically slanted and the actual information that's happening, the negotiations that are happening, could actually be reasonably good. Like, from the organization's point of view, I think almost all of them have said they want to be involved. And that's not just them trying to butter a blizzard. If they didn't want to be involved, they have no reason to butter a blizzard. Yeah, they're just losing money so, already. I actually think... I'm, I'm reapplying the, the hat, by the way. But <laughs> I actually do agree with that. I think that this might be going farther than what you were saying. I think that they were, um, if anything, trying to make Overwatch League look worse to drive down prices potentially and yeah. it's, this could help them get into the overwatch league themselves and even if the even though they're kind of like shit talking blizzard not really but like there's just leaking selective details is what i would say because there's no way that th this is what Bl blizzard presented to the organizations by the way like they they definitely just didn't list all of these negatives and then say and uh now sign up but uh <laughs> yeah. but like 20 million dollars no revenue sharing and uh we don't really care about you for our sports teams sign the yeah. fuck up like that, so, that's not how the negotiation went. I absolutely think that this, in general, is kind of a one-sided view, and I think that they will uh, that they're kind of trying to get into the Overwatch League by by driving down the prices in that sense. I agree with you, and I also think that you know you said it, you said it a couple times that I do have faith in Blizzard. I know that they they do put a lot of their resources, like they've obviously put a ton of resources into making this happen. Um, and you're right, they keep everything behind closed doors, and they're not going to say anything until the day, and, you know, they've been trying to basically keep the boat from leaking until they can actually announce something, um, which hopefully will be soon TM, but, you know, it's, it's the fact that, like, when you starve an entire community of information for that long, you are inviting speculation. Oh, that's yeah, what's for going sure. to happen, and you know that, because that's always been the case. That's how it works in the media forever and so yep. it's surprising to me that they would go that route and not at least give some kind of like something and that's what makes me think that a lot of it's been last minute that a lot their, of it's their response been was scrambling because the fact that we've had no kind of comfort reassuring anything whatsoever makes me think that it's been a lot of things have been just too overwhelming for them to manage in such a short time frame well and to be fair to to your point 
the, their response was not adequate. Like in terms of what it provided, it didn't really say anything at all. I think they're afraid of committing to anything because every time they do, it, it ends up being some kind of obnoxious joke. The thing it kind the, of fights the them in the ass. Inviting one guy to the to the combine. Now you have to do a combine. Like, are they gonna do it? Is it just gonna be a photo <laughs> op? Like, now you're committed yeah, to it. What are you gonna do? Doing that? There's a lot of things that uh, they yeah. committed to in the announcement that they're now having to to actually execute, and I think they're finding a lot more challenging because they're trying to do something that no one's ever done before, and it turns out yeah. that that's hard. <laughs> yeah see this is the whole point as well it, it you can say that you know blizzard um, have executed so far or haven't executed so far or whatever but what they're trying to do is literally unprecedented within the esports realm it's right. like dragging huge businesses in like they're going they're not going for some kind of logical step approach they're just going way straight into the deep end let's <laughs> try and make this like absolutely massive right from the beginning and so even if you were the best company in the world, that would still be a huge challenge. And th there are people pointing the finger and saying that Blizzard are not the best company in the world and have like a bad track record with this kind of thing in other esports. But uh, they have like they've done they, some pretty so far, impressive stuff before. Yeah, now. I mean, they do. And but the the thing is, the reason why there's all of this criticism and like pessimism about it is not because they're incompetent. It's because it's such a mammoth task. It's like yeah. a really huge thing to try and take on. And, we and this was no, like the, their we first have no entrance. no tangible proof of any of it. We have no kind of like vision. We, we can't see their vision. They haven't even shared with us their full vision yet. Oh, no, there's you gonna, can. There's a you lot to more to, factors to it. You, you just have to go to uh, blizzard.com slash overwatch league. Also, I think, uh, I think that part of this is to try to avoid... I think it's pretty easy to avoid CGS because it, it was 10 years ago. It's very fresh in our minds you know, that all of this went down, and so it's easy to kind of see that as the cautionary tale and walk away from it. I think the real cautionary tale for esports as a whole in the bigger picture is the X Games. Do you remember when people used to get sponsored to skateboard? Do you remember when people used to get sponsored to ride BMX bikes? Like, that was a big thing for a while, and everybody thought it was going to make all this money, and I can't remember the last time I heard of a friend of mine getting sponsored played... to do skateboarding. They played like Call of Duty and stuff at X Games, I think. Even uh, they might have played CS:GO or not CS:GO, but CS, some CS there. Yeah, as I'm, well. I'm just attaching yeah, they did. it, keeping it, keeping X Games as like all of the the biking and the skateboarding and the snowboarding and stuff like that. I mean, it just it fell out of favor and it wasn't something that people were interested in anymore and you don't hear about sure. it anymore. And I think that yeah. that's the bigger concern is that esports is the fad, not overwatch not blizzard oh, but okay. the bigger picture because blizzard has always kind of taken that bigger picture kind of thing i mean they they put here's the dorm here's the dorm on tv and there was huge they caught so much flack for that and you just seeing the way that they made these movements over the years leading up to overwatch made it very clear that they've had this in mind for quite a while and this is something they designed the game with esports in mind they built out their other games to test the waters for it i mean it's really clear that they've been focusing on this goal for a very long time. We're seeing the culmination of possibly a decade of work that they've been doing. And I think that's, that that makes me excited because I know that they won't let us down. But at the same time, I think there's a concern when things get so large that you can't manage them as closely as you used to be able to. Yeah, to I don't know fair. about they can't let us down or they won't let us down. Like They might they might let us down. It might still be pretty I mean, good, but they might down, still let I us down. Overall... <laughs> They'll, they'll probably execute what they set out to execute, but I think that their interest is not necessarily in the community. And they, they said, like, oh, we want to keep the orgs in. The orgs aren't necessarily the entire community. I'm concerned about the players. I'm concerned about the analysts and the casters and you guys. Like, that part of the community oh, that I don't keeps care about the this. content going, that keeps people engaged in the community, that keeps people interested in reading over.gg, that's a huge part of the community that they're basically saying, like, we really could not care less about you. Um... But the orgs, they're interested in, and that's what's really that's what really stood out to me about that Yahoo statement was that they the only thing that they mentioned giving a shit about was the orgs that came in and spilled some money, not the players who dropped out of high school or you know had to move back to their parents' basements. Like that's not what they care about, and that that bothers me. Because not the those... ones that moved into their parents' shed. <laughs> yeah, the people that are sacrificing. I mean, Bren's dropping out of university to cast. I mean, that, these pe people are making sacrifices all over the community, and they, those people are the people that they don't care about. They're the only people that they don't care about. They care about the casual players. They care about the organizations. They care about the sports teams. They don't care about Over.GG. 
But that's that's not Blizzard's responsibility. If some moron if wants to go own, and live in his parents' if shed. They want to own everything about the game. They want to <laughs> own the whole esports scene. They want to be Riot. You want to grow up and you want to be Big Boy Riot. Then you should probably care about the people that's driving the but, content. But Blizzard didn't make me any promises, you know? Blizzard didn't no, make any of the people that have dropped all. out promises. I mean, they set out their plan, and other people have, like, extrapolated where they think they'll be able to get and seen, like, yeah. money coming in and, and thought, been very this is a great opportunity. not to spend money investing into the community. They've been very careful not to invest in the community in any way. But I think you have to expect that you need a community in order for an eSport to thrive. Like, you can't build, you can't build something out of nothing. Yeah. Which is why I think that even with, even like if you say that Blizzard are super competent and like behind the scenes everything's working fine, if you were working with that assumption, I still don't really understand why there's been like a drought of information. I mean, like, no, I mean, a drought of actual third party tournaments to play in. Oh, well. sure, yeah. Like, they well, seem to have. Uh... They, they shut, I mean, why would you shut it down? Why would you stop it? That's why I think the, the only reason to stop because... that and to halt all of that is so that you can get the teams to drop their rosters. That's my only reasonable justification for it. But I don't think it's also Blizzard. Like, I don't think Blizzard also shut down third party tournaments. The interview with the Dreamhack guys, they said that it doesn't make sense for them to run a tournament like, yeah, but the like that kind of sites because of the viewership as well. <laughs> the interview with Wade of... from Esports Arena said he wanted to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think, but the I think there's probably different reasons for different companies as well, though, because uh, some of the super large ones, like your ASLs, your maybe not your MLGs actually, because they're kind of tied in, but uh, DreamHack and stuff like that, you know, perhaps they just have had events and didn't see that it would be like profitable or in any way justifiable for them to spend all of the money to run an Overwatch tournament when the viewership that they're going to get is probably somewhere around like 40k or something if they run on Twitch. And it's the the time difficulty stuff. too is that I think a lot of companies tried to test the water by doing onlines and then found that onlines weren't as successful um, but because the online market is completely flooded because that's all that there is you don't get to see how successful an offline can be because we had NGE was done at a convention uh, MLG was Dream done Act. on YouTube, and we've not had a real North American land that wasn't in some way encumbered by some sort of difficulty like that, because you're you're putting yourself behind the curve when you do that. Like, NG, NGE and MLG both so, shot themselves in the foot with their, with their lands. The last land that uh, was, like, actually big within the West was Overwatch Open, in terms of, like, uh, I don't know, no real complications. And that actually had pretty decent viewership, if yeah. I remember correctly. And that, I think they got, they even got like 300,000 people watching on TV as well. So why don't you look at that yeah. and say like, hey, we should do something like that. But instead, like, I, I don't see why you would think that that's not successful for a game that just came out. I would say that's yeah. a huge success, especially compared to what's online. You can, you, can point, you can place that next to the online numbers and say to yourself, well, clearly, this is far more successful than holding a $10,000 online cup. So why don't we do this thing instead far more expense as well it's it's more expensive like but I, I i can't i can't believe that we are the only company that wants to run lands and it and is allowed <laughs> to it's difficult for me to believe that uh let's talk a little bit about uh takeover takeover two because your yourself and brennan will be casting that and i think we're all very excited to see you not ruin a land I, you don't know whether it's going to happen yet. So. <laughs> you might lose your passport. You might get on the wrong trade. You might fall asleep somewhere in Amsterdam. Who knows? The curse uh, of MSI. You never know. The curse yeah. of MSI might live on. We don't know yet. <laughs> There's no way to tell. It's going to be a sick event. Actually, since the, we did the last episode, the final qualifier happened as well, and Movistar Riders just kind of blasted their way through it. They won in the finals 3-0 against Hammers as well. Just kind of ran a train through everybody. So I think in the end... Even though there was only two qualifier spots, the two best teams definitely got through. So it wasn't like there was any kind of fuckery there. Um, so it's going to be a really stacked event, I think, in terms of the talent that Europe's bringing over. We'll see who... There's still two... Is there still two places to be invited? Yes. No. Three? Uh, oh, yeah. Three. The, I think there's three, but I'm kind of assuming... Uh, you know, I don't actually... Even though I'm casting that, I don't have any inside knowledge of who the teams are. Uh, but... I'm assuming that it's probably going to be like United since they're a really top team. They actually dropped out of the second qualifier at the last second. They didn't check in or something. I assume there's like a reason they're not just idiots and didn't <laughs> check in <laughs> because that would be terrible. That would be really bad. Would make sense, yeah. 
But then two more slots. It'll be interesting. I mean, they could almost throw anybody in. Like, the, not anybody, obviously. But they could throw any of the good European teams in or, or the good North American teams. It's already... I mean, it, they could literally just remove those last two spots and it would still be a stacked event. Yeah, definitely. And it's definitely... The, I think, um, presumably, if United does go there, uh, they will have all the top teams from EU, actually. So they'll have Cyclone, who everybody's calling the best. But, I, 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 like haven't really demonstrated it other than like a few online cups, right? Like smaller ones. They have movie star riders who won pit and, uh, other small online cups. And then, uh, um, the H and D. Oh, and H and D. Yeah. So, and then additionally, misfits is a team that everybody talks about, but hasn't actually like demonstrated success that much. And, uh, if United does come, it's like one of the other successful teams within Europe. So it definitely looks like a stacked event. I'm looking forward to it a lot. And then, uh, you know, they have three talented casters and, uh, and, and Bren. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there we go. I, uh, Uber just tweeted as well. Was that last night or was that early? No, it's okay. earlier today. Yeah, he yeah. said, this evening will likely be my last Counter-Strike cast for the foreseeable future. Thanks to all those that encouraged me along the way. And then followed that up by saying, that's not to say that I'm making some big announcement, just shifting my focus to Overwatch, which I feel I have a greater aptitude for. I, I agree with him. I think he's one of the best casters in Overwatch as well. I've said that for a long time. I think back at like APAC Premier when he casted that, I was super like, I really was enthusiastic about that guy's casting. I really like it. Uh, he had the, but... the legendary moment where uh, it was during Envious versus Rogue back in Gamescom when uh, I think it was Unko that took off his headset. Yeah, it, that was put, brilliant. Put your, damn, put your damn headset back on, kid. <laughs> yeah, you're not done yet. Put yeah. your damn headset back on. Uh, he's really good. He's just got uh, a natural affinity for it as well, I think. that He never really found the same kind of success in CS or like the same maybe natural route through it or something. But I think that also, I mean, if you're going to put some speculation in, I know that he says it's not going to be a big announcement, but if he's moving his attention away from Counter-Strike and towards Overwatch, then you got to, I mean, presumably... It would be nonsensical for only Monty and Doa to be doing the entirety of Overwatch League, I think, like like Apex. I don't think they're going for that kind of approach. They're, they're going to have a lot more talent involved. I'm going to say that it's fairly likely that Uber, at some point, is either in negotiations or he's, you know, in, in some sense going to be focusing on it because he is going to be involved in Overwatch League. Because otherwise, what else is he focusing on? Like, is he going to stick with ESL and just, what, just cast, like, occasional tournaments to also, pop up? That doesn't seem likely it? to be. Why come not out who, and say, who? like, I'm leaving instead of just, like, not taking CS jobs anymore? Like, you, could, yeah. you could just stop and not say anything. Hoot hoot, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> all in for the big L. Yeah, I mean, I hope he is as well, because I think he's one of the best casters. So that would be excellent. It, it'll also be, I think, super interesting for me uh, how they decide to structure their talent and the overall look of the Overwatch League. Because first of all, we don't even know like how it's going to work in terms of like where the games are going to be played or how many teams or what the structure is going to be. Mm -hmm. But Apex have gone for this just Monty and Doa doing it for the first two seasons, and now they've got two teams that they rotate in. Lots of other online events that Blizzard had an involve in or involvement in, like the MLG thing, MLG Vegas, and That's now MLG are run, uh, like thing in loads of talent, like people swapping in all the time. They even had specialized desk people like Flame, where they I don't think they've done that for anything else, have they? They've not had somebody who just stays on the desk the whole time unless oh, they're hosting. The host. Yeah, no. Yeah, so I think oh. it's really interesting to see where they decide to go on that vein. Maybe Gamescom actually. I don't know if. Uh... Oh, was Star? No, I think I Star casted. They they had fish sticks as well. I did fish, I don't know whatever. Yeah, I think I think they were casted. I think they had like a rotating thing where they constantly had people on. I think in fact they did the same game together, uh, Star and Fish Sticks. There we go. Um, okay. But yeah, that that's interesting to me because there's a couple of routes that they could go with it. But if they want to go like balls out, all like huge production, then having some kind of desk does seem to be the way that most companies are doing it. Like the CS and the League of Legends and stuff have like a, a desk with casters. And normally you have like set desk people as well, not just casters that they rotate. Although, does League do that? No, in League of Legends, they have this weird... They, they like mix up every pair and stuff like that. So it, I think uh, Monty did a video about this actually, but like without going into too much detail yet, they don't really have a set desk. But um, I think it would be better if they did, honestly. Overwatch needs so the Yanko. Yeah. <laughs> I love Yanko. I love Man, too. I love that guy. He's he's so cute and he's got such a like fantastic knowledge of the it game so and like cheeky. ability to break it down. Yeah. It's hilarious to to listen to. So yeah, it's not like Mitch has actually said that he's involved in Owl, but I think it seems 
kind of reasonable to expect there's at least something coming up for him if he's going to purely focus on Overwatch. Overwatch so yeah. yeah, so I'll be super interested. I haven't seen it. Like, he hasn't been casting it in ages, it feels like. So I'm I'm hyped for that. I enjoyed myself an Uber Shouts cast. And you will live as well. I will. Yeah. I'll just be sat there listening instead of getting on with anything else that I'm supposed to be doing. You'll be in the crowd shouting, you're so bad. <laughs> just Bring so back Sideshow. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that should be a super good tournament, though. I'm really looking forward to seeing how Rogue, like, if Rogue get knocked out of Apex in their game against Lunatic High, uh, if, you know, how they actually compare against the rest of the European talent as well. Because at the moment, there's been no strand to connect like Movistar and X Cyclone to anybody else in all of the rest of the scene, unless you say like they beat Misfits and Misfits went close against X. So it's it's been very tenuous to link all of these narratives and compare them all together. So it'll be a really nice uh, bit just to tie up a couple of loose ends at the very least. Yeah, absolutely. Well, very excited to see it and good luck. You know you'll kill it. <laughs> supremely, right. supremely confident. Don't worry. All right. Well, we uh, I think we've done enough chin flapping for today. I think we'll leave it to next week. <laughs> Thanks for watching, guys. Have a good week. Peace. Peace.